a mysterious transmission, a bump in the night, a message its meaning lost to time. You have found the Phenomenauts Podcast. Welcome, 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 you cavalcade of cellular activity. You've tuned into the Phenomenons Podcast, where we look at the weird, wonderful, and mysterious happenstances of this, and occasionally other universes. We are your new overlock... I mean hosts. Myself, <laughs> D-Barnes, and the magnificent... Amber Hall. Don't forget, folks. Or rather, remember. We're everywhere. We've transcended the, mater- the material realm, in fact, and ascended to the digital... And by that, I simply mean we're out and about online. Yeah. yeah. Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, Transistor. Uh, please give us a like, follow, share, comment, download. Any kind of interaction. We just love hearing from you folks. And that's the opening out of the way. Amber, how's it going? It's, it's, it's going pretty well. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm back at work now. Isn't that nice? Just ticking over just nicely. Going well? Hmm. I, I, I like this, though. We're in cyberspace as well. I know. We're yeah. digital. There's a version of me, and it's not me. We don't share our experiences, but I'm out there. Dun, dun, dun. How's it going, dude? Not too bad, not too bad. Just cracking along, trying to get everything done. Usual, usual, getting on with the uni work. That's just how or it is. at least trying to. <laughs> Taking over just nicely. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So, should we get this show on the road? Yeah, let's go. All right. So, Amber, I do believe you wanted to start us off this week because you had a pretty big topic and we don't we want to make sure we don't run over too yeah. much. Yeah, I don't know how long this is going to take. It's a bit of an ambitious one, but then again, I am an ambitious one. Well, into the breach with us. It is quantum computing. So, oh, there's been I do some... love this one. There's, there's cool stuff goes on with this all the time, but here's a specific one that I've got. Uh, so, Dee, as I understand it, um, you know your way around this topic, don't you? Because you were actually close to pursuing this at university. Well... <clears throat> I stu- so I study web development. It's not exactly computer science. I, I don't know a ton, but I have always had a bit of an a- in quite an active interest in quantum computing just because, well, it sounded really cool. And then you look it at once and then you look up a few things and then, yeah. you know, before you know it, you're reading articles and... You know, this is... I know a, so I know a little bit. I wouldn't say I'm any kind of expert. Because I feel like, you know, if you were there when computing was just starting to get off the ground, it would have been really cool to watch it happen. And I think that's what we're seeing with quantum computing. Well, exactly, yeah. I kind of have the exact same feeling towards when It's kind of what piqued my interest. Because I'm like, this is this will be the next big thing. Like, it makes yeah. me laugh because I remember talking to a, an actually an IT teacher in high school. And, like, I remember asking at one point, what, what do you think the next sort of big technological leap will be? Like, it was, like, probably... 14 at the time, 15, you know, because I was was just curious. And he said, I think, like, while there are a lot of very cool ideas out there, that quantum computing is the most likely next step in technology because it it simply lets us do more and do it faster. Yeah, so it's it's not like an incremental increase, like, oh, we have more transistors or we have memory or whatever. It's it's very hard because I would never describe... People are... I think a lot of the perception of it is it's like an upgrade to modern computing. You know, it's the level two. It's, it's fundamentally uh, It's colour TV when before we've had, um, you know, mono... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Monochrome. Monochrome TV. Mm. Whereas, in fact, it's kind of... It's almost it's almost a different technology altogether. Yeah, it's like the difference between, uh, I don't know, electricity and Wi-Fi or something like yeah. that. Yeah. It's like... It, Honestly, the fact that we have Wi-Fi now, wireless devices mm. and batteries and stuff like that, it's how that is different to like you know stationary like you know a washing machine or something. Like yeah, that. really, it's going to change everything. So um, I'm going to try and simplify it so so we can all get on that hype train together. Good. Um, so please correct me uh, if I'm wrong or elaborate when you see fit. Uh, I'll, I'll do my absolute best. As I said, I'm not a professional, but I'll I'll try. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. I shall now cease my stalling. <laughs> just, just a cheeky little anti Jonah joke there for you. Yeah. Just, a, just a sly little reference. Just right, in there. Uh, right, so in normal computing, everything's encoded using ones and zeros. That's like the base of it. So this might ring a bell for a lot of people. Uh, binary is all 01001000011010101. So. Yeah, that, bun- had, that had a pretty good beat to it, I'm going to be honest. Yeah, I can freestyle over it. Nice, nice. Um, so with the computer, all processes are just a bunch of these stepping stones, basically. Hop, one, hop, zero, hop, zero, hop, yep. one. So even your device that's playing this right now and the things that we're recording on, it's just a heck load of these bits. Just 
bit, right, that's bits, right? Bits? A bit. <clears throat> so, so we've got that in common with computers, hmm. full of bits. Yeah, we're just all about those bits. But like a bit can be one or zero. Yeah. And everything's made of bits. Megabits, kilobits, gigabits. You've heard it. All the bits. Uh, they're, they're right there, all the bits. We've got megabits as though. Kilobits. Um, so look how much it can be computed using this method. We've simulated the eventual merger of the Milky Way and Andromeda Galaxy in 4.5 thousand million years. And this is just using conventional computing from astronomical measurements that we have. You know, you try fighting a max level amiibo on Smash Bros. <laughs> Like, I go in for a move and they're all like, one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, one, and they just, pff, I'm dead. Like, you've seen how quick they can do I, it. I can't believe you got a Smash reference in here. That's it. I always thought that was really cool because I went, what, what are you talking about, Amiibo? It's got an AI in it. What are you talking about? You put it on Smash Bros and it'll learn and it'll learn and it'll supersede you and it'll start to do crazy good moves. It's all ones and zeros. I think that's amazing. Uh, for God's sake, they only use the computing power of a pocket calculator to supposedly go to the moon. Yeah. As if you think you can convince me the moon's real. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the technological age is built on this base of ones and zeros. It's fundamental to computing. Now, quantum computing differs in a crucial way. So a qubit, the quantum computing equivalent of a bit, is able to be in a state of zero, one, and zero and one at the same time. So, I mean, first off, I go, well, that's one more state. So, you know, mm -hmm. imagine the possibilities. It's going to be like 50% better. But, I mean, first, consider that combinations, uh, like what combinations we have of, of zero and one. Double zero, double one, and then zero one and one zero, right? Four combinations, that's it. So that would take a conventional computer, four processes for those four combinations, because they go, Let's try one, try mm -hmm. another, try, try. Trial and error. Yeah, trial and error, really, is what it does. Yeah. That's why they're good at calculations, but they're not good at coming up with ideas, because they just bam, 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 yeah. steps. So. It's following a very set task, a set of instructions that are given to it to do, so it effectively goes set of tasks, problem, solution. Yeah. So a quantum computer can, uh, can compute all four possibilities at the same time. It can just sort of simulate all four outcomes as opposed to actually doing them. Um, so it does this by having two qubits in a state of both zero and one. So two qubits can do four as opposed to four bits doing the same mm -hmm. amount. So uh, the qubits, they're kind of like Schrodinger's cat. They're both dead and alive. I was going to say, I do love a good Schrodinger comparison here. That, that, but this is what he was talking about. No. Superposition. I, yeah, 100%. It, it's a really good... So do we want to run through Schrodinger's cat just in case we'll, anyone... We'll just quickly. So you get a cat, you stick it in a box... And it's a very put, mean hypothetical. And you put some poison in there, I think it is. But you, uh, like you know, it's it's a trap that it's got fifty fifty chance of going off and killing the cat. Yeah. Without any inside knowledge of what's going on in the box, the cat is both dead and alive. It's literally both dead and alive because it is both until you open it and then you see one of them. So it's called a superposition. It means to be in like all possible, you know, mm. eventualities. Uh, so computer boffins have begun to design algorithms in the right way to harness the power of this superposition to massively improve computation. So a two qubit machine allows for four calculations simultaneously. A three qubit machine allows for eight calculations. Four bit qubit machine does 16 and so on and so on. So algorithms with massive amounts of input, like brute force hacking my email, for example, is exponentially easier to a quantum computer because it doesn't have to try everything one at a time. It can just effectively try all the things at once and, well, does it? Right, well, this is the one bit that it does actually have me confused. I can't remember, I didn't know in the first place, either mm. or. So it can effectively do all of the trial and error at once, eliminating yeah. the need to do the trial and error because mm -hmm. it all happens simultaneously. Yeah. Can it then act on the correct solution or is it still stuck playing out so, all of the scenarios at once. So uh, they built algorithms around it, and I, I right. actually get into that a little bit later. Cool. I think it's really cool how they do it. Um, so yeah, um, it, it doesn't try combinations one by one. It computes multiple possibilities at the same time, so it gets through those things much, much faster. Trivia time! <laughs> That's a good trivia time. That's right, it's back. The amount of numbers needed to describe 100 quantum states is... Do you want to have a guess? No. 100 qubit... Uh, oh, a hundred quantum, like qubits. Mm -hmm. How many numbers to fully describe that? So basically, how many processes could that simulate? It's a ridiculously high number, I know that. No, 
It's not oh. that. It's one. <laughs> no, it, right. So I put no with an exclamation mark to try and disprove your guess, but you didn't do a guess, so it doesn't make sense. No, right. it's one nonillion, two hundred and sixty-seven octillion, six hundred and fifty septillion, six hundred sextillion. 228 quintillion, 229 quadrillion, 401 trillion, 496 billion, 703 million, 205,375. So just a bit then? Yes. 100 qubit computer can simulate that many numbers. And, well, yeah. I mean, do you, do you want an idea of how big that is in uh, this next subsection? Trivia time and space. Oh, Mm. The Milky Way contains up to 400 billion stars, and the universe contains Six approximately minutes. 80 billion galaxies. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if every galaxy had 400 billion stars like our Milky Way, the total number of stars in the entire observable universe would be 32 sextillion. This is 40 million times less than the amount of possible states a 100-bit qubit computer can take. 40 million times the amount of stars in the universe. That's a lot. That's, That's just 100 just a lot. qubits. That's very small, 100 qubits. Uh, so, one of my sources... You say that's very small, but it is not very small. 100, well, 100 qubits. Imagine having 100 bits. <clears throat> it's, it's a I think it's a tenth of a, a kilobyte. Yeah, no. In A tenth of a kilobyte. In size, it may be small, but in scale, it is huge. What, what it can do is unfathomable. Yeah, like, so, you get what I mean? This yeah. is why it's an exciting technology. Uh, so, one of my sources described it like this. Each qubit is like a coin. Uh, the bits in conventional computing has either a heads or a tails. So you flip it, heads, flip it, tails. So either 100% heads or 100% tails, that's all it can do. Because mm. the coin lands and it's in a state. Qubits don't land. They just spin round and round and round with possibilities possible, like both are possible, but neither has actually happened. It could land on heads, could land on tails, it's just in the air. Um, so that's the superposition. Uh, what we can do is express this state of a qubit as a ratio of heads to tails. And okay. that, that's how the, the algorithms look at it. So instead of just going, give me the data, the one or the zero, it says, what's the ratio of one to zero possibility in this one qubit? That's how the algorithms look at, at them. Okay. So normally the chance of uh, a coin landing either heads or tails is 50-50. But that ratio can be manipulated without having to actually look at the qubit and collapse it into one state. So it gets the state in superposition. So these quantum coins can be prepared so as to be, for example, 25% heads, 75% tails. So when we do actually look at, the, uh, look at it, the state is three times more likely to be tails than heads. So they're able to manipulate the possibility of it being one or the other. And that's how the, the algorithms work. They like manipulate the, the ratios of the, the bits which is, just sounds crazy. So when quantum computers provide an answer, it's in the form of a probability. When the question is repeated, the answer changes slightly because of that random error, but it'll never eliminate the answer because that's, that's what is actually the answer. So the more times the question is repeated, the closer the final response comes to the correct answer. So quantum code contains properties that cancel out wrong answers and amplify correct ones. So even though it takes 100 repeats of the question, say, it's still exponentially faster than con conventional computing for certain tasks, like hacking my email account. Please don't hack my email. I, I know I've you used it. You keep going back to this one. Is this, a, is this a, is this a deep-seated fear? Don't, don't hack my email, please. Please. <laughs> so forgive me as well. We get into the phenomenon part, which is what got me onto this topic in the first place, which in fact happens to be actual instantaneous teleportation. Um, I'm sorry, what? Yeah, teleportation's real. And quantum computers have been doing it since 2012. But but we're getting there. Uh, okay, just hang on. We're getting there. Okay. We're getting there. Okay, I'll put it on hold. Just put a, I'll put a pin in that one. Uh, I, remember, I know. I was like, oh, I'll try and simplify it as much as I can. This is more difficult than I, I, uh, than I thought. Right. But we'll try and get into it. We it gets can, more we, crazy. We, we can get through it. More crazy. More crazy. You've so, made sense thus far. I certainly hope. You've not lost me yet. And that's good. Maybe I will in this next Admittedly, section. Admittedly, I have a little bit of foreknowledge, but haven't lost me yet but the, this next bit is, is the more crazy stuff. So, turns out you can split light particles into perfect copies of each other. Um, if you shine a laser beam through a special type of crystal, it splits a photon into two. So, one photon, split, now we have two. These are quantum entangled particles. Which means whatever happens to one happens to the other. Yeah, so In people may have heard quantum entanglement before, but what it means is to have two identical particles rendered from the same original 
and they interact. They basically do the opposite of one yeah, another. Yeah, you, you put you to use a really like it's probably a really crude metaphor, but like to push one down would mean the other would rise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty much that. So if you say uh, shone one of the photons through those three D glasses that polarize the light in mm. a certain way, it would turn the, the photon up, and then the other photon that could be hundreds of miles away and theoretically infinite distance away mm -hmm. would turn down immediately as you polarize this one upwards yep so that's that's what we mean by entangled um so this weird property of entangled particles is still quite the mystery to science actually uh, einstein called this effect spooky action at a distance um so have we mentioned that before well, I, I think I might have said it in quantum episodes before. I was going to say, like, just the sentence spooky actions at a distance sounds this, uh, quite familiar. When Einstein found out this property, he went, there's no way this, can, this, this breaks the laws of physics. You can't have instantaneous information transport. So he called it spooky action at a distance. I mean, he just went, we mustn't understand yeah, something about this it, situation. This can't be possible. It is certainly a, like a feat of... Uh, Scientific engineering, what? if that's possible. Yeah, consider information can only travel at the speed of light. Cause and effect can only travel at the speed of light as things knock on in effect. Yeah, quantum entanglement. Quantum entanglement. It's instantaneous Go regardless of distance. Instantaneous over infinite distance. I don't. We don't know how it yeah, works. Yeah, that does kind of... How, how, how do we... Wait, how do we do it if we don't know how it works? Uh, because we, we've been able to create situations where entangled particles happen because nature is capable of doing it. Oh, okay, cool. But when we fuck with them, it's just like, well, <laughs> I have no idea how it works. It's yeah. crazy. Um, so, yeah, uh, mess with one of an entangled pair and the other will do the opposite instantaneously. Uh, even if that information about what you're doing over here has travelled to another observer faster than the speed of light. Mm. That's right, quantum computers can transmit the state of their qubits faster than the speed of light instantaneously over theoretically infinite distances. So basically wow, that is there's some there's some weird stuff going on. Right, so we've got like light speed, you know, exponentially powerful quantum computers. That's why it's exciting. So in 2012, a paper was published in Nature titled Quantum Teleportation Over 143 Kilometers Using Active Feed Forward. In the study, they managed to, you guessed it, teleport a quantum state over 143 kilometers instantaneously. Over, um, I think it was over like actual, you know, networks that you would just have in real life. Like, you know, just the network we have for like fiber optic and stuff. Mm. They did it within that. So they're like, you could have computers com computing through fiber optic networks and stuff like that. Crazy. Um, so other researchers have even managed to not only create an even more formidable quantum state called a quitrit. Oh, wait, no, I've skipped forwards. Oh, no. You know what I forgot about? What? Trivia time. <gasps> <gasps> trivia time. I've got another one. I skipped right over it. I'm sorry, trivia time. Are you okay? Right. Uh, so, <laughs> Precious trivia time. So the information they sent over 143 kilometers instantaneously would have taken a 296th of one second to travel that distance. So guess how many times light speed the information traveled? Like how many times faster than light speed it traveled? I have no idea, but if it's instantaneous, like regardless of distance, does the speed of it even matter? <laughs> Well, you kind of landed on it, yeah. Funnily enough, it's infinitely faster because it's instantaneous. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it, surely it would be like, if we had to put a speed between the two things happening, then it's only going to exponentially rise for however distant it is from the thing originally. If you teleport something the smallest possible amount of distance, it's still infinitely faster than the speed of light because it's no speed. It's infinite. Oh, yeah. It's instantaneous. It's at the same time. That's that what's so sense. crazy about it. Well, it doesn't make... It's weird saying that makes sense to a, a very, like, <laughs> highly theoretical... Instantaneous teleportation of quantum information. Hmm. Oh, yes, I've heard about this. Oh. We were talking about this last Tuesday, weren't we, I've been? <laughs> Oh, yeah, so just over a sip of brandy, quantum teleportation. Um, I actually missed a bit that I've realised that I'm putting in my notes, which is oh, basically how, how, it, how this works, basically. So what they have, uh, quantum, uh, uh, what's it called, cryptography. Mm -hmm. So it's basically how do you encrypt uh, messages with quantum information so they can't be hacked. So usually what happens is if someone steals your information or taps in or something like that, they kind of, uh, they either take, get the information that was coming to you and then they do whatever they want with it and send it to you. And then you think that it came from the original mm. sender. Or they just have a peek in and then just let it go on its way. 
And it's unfortunate that there's no way to know if someone's peeked in and had a look at the information as it's been going. That's why we use, you know, yeah. encryption where so, end-to-end encryption. So sort of functionally, you know, as, as a metaphor here, it's we're doing the same thing with quantum computers. We have a look in at those uh, infinitely sort of happening simulations of the thing we want, and we kind of go, okay. So, so the, the the so the 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 thing about it is that you can't uh, you can't interrupt a quantum uh, sort of like communication. What you do is send the uh, sort of it's really difficult to explain. So what they do is have like three people involved. So one person on one end goes, "What's the quantum state of this one?" And then this person goes, "Yes, I can confirm it's the opposite of what you said." Whereas if anyone would have interrupted that and had a look in, it would have collapsed the wave okay. function. So, so then does that mean quantum it, would, it would arrive already in a state hmm. and you'd go, it's already in a state. Would, would that mean quantum computing is theoretically safer than modern computing? Definitely. It's, it's impossible to, to intercept quantum data transfer. That's amazing. Because you'd go, here they come, my superposition qu- qu- uh, qubits. And they'll turn up and they're already facing up or down or sideways or left or right. And at that point you're like, well, something's so, happened to my someone, qubits. Someone's already looked at yeah. this transmission, so don't send it. But if a superposition arrives, you go, right, cool. A, an outside observer has a look at the original one. And then you confirm that it's the opposite of that. And that's that's how you do it. So basically, this like third party transfer is just normal computing. But mm. you could send you know very sensitive information using quantum computing. And then just have it, because uh, like you know, say third party here says, I'm just telling you what the quantum state is, but I'm not telling you anything about the content of the information. Mm. So this could be intercepted, but it doesn't mean anything because they're just telling you, yes, you uh, have you got this key to unlock it, and you go yes, and then you just have the information. So it's like it's totally safe. All the sensitive stuff is completely uncrackable, and then the other normal transmission is just how to uncrack this. That's very cool. So it, it it's basically just completely safe. There's That's no very way cool. there's no way anyone could look at it because you would just collapse the wave form. So yeah, the superposition keeps it super safe. Brilliant. Mm. That's a uh, super cool. Super cool. Okay, so uh, other researchers have even managed to not only create an even more formidable quantum state called mm. a quitrit oh. or a qtrit, which is a quantum version of a trit which can be zero, one, or two. It ha- so this is literally zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, and all the things we can do with that. Mm-hmm. Now you can have zero, one, two. Ooh. And what, how many combinations can you have of that? Zero, one, two, point oh. <laughs> and, or you can be in a superposition of all of those, which means it's like even more exponentially powerful. So a hundred qubit system can do all those numbers. You would need like a three qtrit system to do the same. It's like, it's absolutely unbelievably like more formidable to have three possible states that is absolutely crazy it is pretty wild so what's more they these researchers even developed a method of consistently producing the qtrits so it'll be easier for other people to do research on it in the future so one of the problems at, at this point was uh people couldn't reliably create mm. these entangled pairs and they not only went look, we've been able to do it with Qtrits. Here's a really good method on how to make them yourself in your own lab. Brilliant. So it's going to make it easier for researchers in the future. That's one of them. Obviously, the more we, we the more people mess around with this, you know, effectively start new technology, the, mm. the better it's going to get, the more readily available it's going to get, the yeah. more... And this is going to lead to, uh, hopefully, in the near future, uh, we're going to be having crazy advanced quantum computers doing all sorts in, in society. And you know what? I look forward to science with that Mm. because you can do crazy like projections of like, you know, the laws of physics and like see how you do fluid dynamics. Like I feel like possibly you could do these these uh, simulations that are just not possible at the moment, like fluid and like air movement and stuff like that. And like it's something like once you have like a couple of points of tension in like, you know, a building design, you just can't compute what would happen, like how the tension is going to play out. Mm. You could with a quantum computer. That's very cool. It's fantastic. It, it, it will certainly revolutionise modern computing. I definitely say that. Absolutely. Or rather, it has or is. <laughs> the, the technological age is only just starting. It's going to be fantastic. Mm. Um, but yeah, that that's what I meant by teleportation. I know it's uh, unfortunately it's not like you know Star Trek, beam me up, Scotty, <laughs> and then you just like teleport away. 
Um, so, you know, everyone just keep buying your monthly bus ticket to get to work. There'll be no teleporter booths. Well, I'll still take it. Yeah. <laughs> so the quantum world is bizarre. It's achieved reversal of time. Yep, I remember us talking about that. In episode 21, if you want to watch that one. Mm -hmm. uh, perceptual immortality. I remember that one too. In episode 8. And teleportation, but not really any of those things. <laughs> kind of weird. I love it when the word quantum gets brought up, because A, because it sounds very science-y, you know. Mm. Very cool and stuff. Very, like, you know, the sci-fi we all think of. But I also, there is now, it's just ingrained in my brain whenever I hear the word quantum, I'm like, this is going to be complicated. Yeah, pretty much. Like, my brain immediately, is, I'll read an article or, like, a headline of company, it'll say the word, so like, oh, this is it, quantum. Okay, time yep. to be bamboozled. Jesus, <laughs> yep. But... I think that's crazy that this is sci-fi technology. It really is. We're really starting to hit an age. You know, we got like we're, we're we're on the precipice of like fusion technologies and like quantum computing and th this all. Read something very cool about fusion technologies the other day that I plan to uh, stick in a in in one of our next few episodes. Hopefully, D, D I'm always down. I'm always mm. down for fusion. I love fusion. We're making some steps in that direction. Okay, I have now ceased my uh, my science babble. <laughs> Please, let's take us in a different direction. All right, then. So for this week, after how well the last episode went and how well we thought it went, I thought we'd kind of keep up the theme of we're just going to analyse a case study of something a bit paranormal. Okay. Um, you know, I'll read a story that I found online, read it once again. The um, link will be in the sources. I've also got the usernames as I go through. I um, read it. Yeah. Um, let's get on with it. Oh, yeah. Okay. So the first username was sadly deleted. But the, as it, the link is in the description. Um, Ooh, mysterious. <coughs> yeah. Deleted. Mm. Mm. Adds some intrigue, doesn't it? Mm. It <laughs> does a little bit. So, um, and I'm just reading it directly from the source here. Lived in, lived in an old two-bedroom, three-story walk-up for a time in my early 20s in Toronto. A few days after moving in, my roommate Mike chides me in the morning for banging on the wall that separated our bedrooms and pacing back and forth across the apartment at night. We just agreed he must have dreamed it or it was sounds from other apartments, as I had done no such thing. We agreed that it must have been nothing and left it at that, but this became a regular nightly occurrence. <laughs> Shortly thereafter, I started noticing, a cer noticing at certain times in my own bedroom the cloying smell of cheap women's perfume mixed with a damp, musty smell. Imagine an old person's clothes left on a damp and musty basement floor near a litter box that wasn't being changed often enough. <laughs> you, you get the idea. Whoa, that's 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 really right. This ghost has just been slayed, just roasted. What made it even What made it even weirder is that I would be filled with a sudden horrible sense of foreboding every few moments before the smell would begin. Mike flaked out and left only four months into our one year lease, which meant I was left footing the rent for the entire place until I could find another roommate. I had decided. To <laughs> I think you have another roommate. <laughs> <laughs> I had decided to try and sleep in his bedroom shortly after he moved to see if things would get better. The very first night I slept in his former room, I had an incredibly detailed and realistic nightmare of myself standing in a dimly lit bathroom of the apartment and cutting my own face with a large shard of glass, staring into the broken bathroom mirror. Um, it was only broken in the dream. The, in that scene from a movie where he pulls his face off. I don't know. I think it's Poltergeist or something like that, where he's just kind of like. It, it's a really famous scene where he's looking in the mirror and he like just starts scratching at his face oh. and he just starts like pulling chunks off his face and he just pulls his whole like face off. Well, he was saying he cut his face off with a shell of the broken mirror. I, I mean, equally threatening auras. Hmm. Soon, soon after that, I started to hear loud bangs at night and the flushing of the toilet in the bathroom. Several times the hot water in the bathtub turned on full blast in the middle of the night. One of the freakier things that happened not too long before I moved is the time I was woken up by the TV blaring poltergeist on city tv at about two in the morning and at the time that channel would play movies late at night but the fact the fact that the one time my analog tv turned a knob to change the channel or volume pull a knob turn it on uh turned on by itself at full blast hmm. uh, was the time a, pol a movie like the poltergeist was playing <sighs> this what is all very that this <laughs> Very troubling stuff, D. Right, because I know, I know it's so easy to just go, ah, well, you know, you're lying is <laughs> basically the <laughs> direction. But, right, let's consider this. You, yourself, find that you're alone in a house. It's locked. You live alone and you hear thumping and then the toilet flushing. I have lived alone. How um, 
terrifying this would be. Well, I'm I'm gonna go, like the way I was thinking about it is I'm gonna go through the stages of what. So we heard you know nightly nightly sounds that were pretty ominous, but you know I, I've lived in a lot of houses where you get weird creaks and sounds that sound like they're coming from where they shouldn't. You know, I don't think every time that happens it's ghosts, but, but if it could be ghosts. If you walked into your bathroom and the water was blasting out. Oh, I, this is the thing. Hang on. Let me go through it because my skeptic meter gets reduced severely each time. So I'm like, could discount the walking across the landing. You know, I feel like I could pass that on the banging. Uh, yeah. I could pass that off as the pipes or something. Yeah, I could yeah. I could rationalise that, I think. Hmm. I wouldn't be... I would be uncomfortable and I'd be scared, but I think I could just manage with that one. Yeah. The smell. <laughs> I, I really like that it was just like... You know, it smelled like a bit of a woman's perfume. Actually, it was more like a litter box. It was just like because, because part of me would be like, oh, maybe it, maybe I've just got damp or something. Maybe there's something you know, like fungi growing in the carpet, or you know, something. Yeah. Something's going on. But why would I feel a sense of dread? I like it. Uh, I fear. A, uh, I have a an immense sense of dread, and then I uh, have this I smell, this weird smell, and I'm like, I think that's just gas. <laughs> Well, I could, I would attribute, you know, the feeling and the smell to maybe something like gas. But again, we're getting to something that's quite, quite specific. Like what? that's that's a rare happenstance at best. I'm, I'm just saying, I I sense a massive amount of foreboding before I fart. <laughs> <laughs> so like, I, I, I mean, have, I do too. To I be have honest, foreboding like... farts at work all day. <laughs> Thanks for this, Amber. And I'm sorry for any of Amber's colleagues. I gotta like get out, go I've in the toilet. I've shared a tent with Amber more than once. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that was very foreboding. <laughs> Sometimes I just got to, you know, s uh, sign into personal, go head over to the toilets and just let all that foreboding out in the toilet where it's not going to hurt anyone. <laughs> oh, Lord. I, but but, but I, a strange smell. Yeah. I mean, the, the one that gets me is like the TV turning on. <laughs> and the fact that it's poltergeist as well is just so bad. Yeah, that, the, on an analogue TV. Oh. Like... I know if you if you wake up and you can hear your TV on full blast, and you've I've already had all these weird, crazy stuff, I'd be lying there like, oh man, I have to get up and turn it off. Oh, because it's manual. Oh, because it, it sounds stupid. I had said it was analog, but like my brain, when I think of turning a TV off, funnily enough, because my TV is in fact my, also my computer, so mm. I just turn my computer off and use the remote to turn my TV. Off. But you've got to get up to turn it off. So you're gonna have to like get out of bed, walk in the oh, hallway. No. Walk into the room and there's just a TV blaring to an empty room, and you're I'll like the scary movie on it. So you're like, okay, so I assume the ghost has done this. Is the ghost still here? Am I good to just go and turn the TV off? Like every time, you know, that if I'm just like sat there and I go, I can hear the water running, mm. and I open the door and I can hear it a bit louder, and I'm like, mm -mm. no. Mm. And as you slowly open the bathroom door, oh, you're expecting to no. see a ghost in there somewhere, and you have to go and turn it off, and then just get back to your normal life. You know what? I'm the other housemate, the one who just gets the hell out. <laughs> well, the thing I think the thing that gets me, so the smell thing, again, I'm like, I could maybe, I would have to at a stretch, but I could maybe try and cope with it. Do you know what I mean? I'd yeah. just be like, oh, maybe I'm just, you know, asso falsely associating things because, yeah, sure. you know, that happens. But when stuff starts being... Someone moves out and you're like, like, you know, why, why would they move out? Like... Sort of, you know what I mean? But someone moves out, and if you hadn't done anything to make them want to move out, then surely you've got to think something's going yeah, on. Yeah, I'm like, I know they're getting spooked by the same things I am. So it's not just me going crazy and, like, being over, like, you know, reactive. The other person absolutely bailed. So I'm going to, you know, but then you go, oh, yeah, they had a, you know, I'm going to go, I, I, you know, I'll deal with it. And then for the first night you're sleeping in their old room, you have a massively weird nightmare. An oddly specific nightmare. I really hate that. As soon as you started saying that, it's like, so I went and stayed in the other guy's room just to see if it would help. Like, maybe it doesn't sound as bad, the banging and stuff. And you have a really vivid nightmare of you cutting your own face off. See, that's after one night. What if the same thing was happening to Mike, like, nightly? <sighs> and it would be, because there's going to be so many things that they don't... So they go, there's banging and scraping and thumping and stuff. That probably just happened in between all these things. Mm. This is over a period of, like, months. Then, you know, so f th your toilet flushing is, like, that requires a manual input. I don't think you can just make a toilet flush. You know, m maybe the tap 
it's just kind of got loose in the water. Yeah, the tap could be, be a, could be a pressure thing or, you know, something not being wired up properly or, you know. A toilet is at a level where it needs to be forced into flushing. Yeah. So that's... It doesn't accidentally flush. That doesn't happen. And then happen. after all that, for your TV to turn itself on. It's not great, D. I've got to say. I, that one, I... I'm too scared to disregard everything in it. I'm gonna be honest. Look, like, I, look, I don't have any explanation. I don't have any explanation, but some of that is hella spooky. You know, I almost want a haunting to happen to me. I hope the next house I move into is haunted, like completely haunted, because I really don't believe in ghosts. So I'm gonna be on that. Like, I'm either gonna go look at this really compelling haunted house. I've just thoroughly destroyed it, or I find enough convincing evidence that there is something that we don't understand happening at which point that's really cool because then i open a box of ghost stories mm. i find it interesting because like my my stance on with most things is i do i think there is more to more than we than we know because hmm. there always is yeah um Spook, I don't say that necessarily. Mean, yeah, I'm not necessarily mean meaning that that's inherently like ghosts. I'm just saying there is more to what we know than what we actually know. We do it all the time. We find new things. Well, and, and while I would like to be very rational and say I, I don't, I've never seen any evidence to prove ghosts. Spooky things have happened that I haven't been able to explain, and I can yeah. see how I would very easily go to ghosts to explain that because yeah. I have no other rational explanation. Yeah. So, so I mean. Uh, you know, I'm very much of the mind, look, we can have explanations. We yeah, have like, the tools to be able to explain everything. I'm skeptic, but I'm open-minded. Yeah, like, like, if you, if I, that's why I meant if my house is super haunted, either science prevails and, like, the critical mind prevails, or I... I just found something entirely yeah, new. I get given enough evidence to go, right, I was skeptical, but it doesn't mean that I'm just going to go, nope, nope, no, nope, no, nope, mm. and deny. You give me enough you know, evidence to persuade mm. me that I go, I've experienced a lot of things yep. and I have been thorough and there's been no explanation. Maybe there's something we don't understand going on here. Spooky action. Knows? Spooky action at a distance. At least I'd like to keep it that way. Because <laughs> just haunted house over there, please. Because, uh, like, while, while I'm saying, you know, I'm sceptic but open-minded, the thought still scares the crap out of me. Oh, yeah, no, it'd suck. Even if, even if I was like, ghosts don't exist, if there's thumping and banging and flushing and TV's coming on, I'd be like, yep. oh, I need my sleep, though. It doesn't matter how much yep. of a critical mind I have. I'm, oh, I'm tired. So, I think we can squeeze my other story in. Oh, I am. I'm in a spooky mood. Let's go. So, I lived in a haunted apartment. It was two rooms, but one of the rooms was locked, and I didn't have the key. So, I only had one small room as a kitchen, dining room, bedroom. And a screen, and a screen, and a screen in the porch is what I think that's meant to say. Mm. There were two especially freaky events. One night, my girlfriend slept over, and she woke up in the middle of the night. Said she saw the bathroom bathroom door open and a shadowy figure standing in the bathroom, staring at her. The bathroom was right across from the from the locked room. Another time, I was jerked awake by the fire alarm going off, just blaring. But when I went to unplug the plug it, the alarm stopped, and no other alarm in the building was going off. Uh. I think it's the volume of a fire alarm going off in the middle of the night and then just stopping. A lot of, not, and none of the others going off either. I know. A lot of things that happen could have just been my neighbours. See, I like these kinds of stories because like, they give me a bit of, you know, rationalising in there. Yeah. But the way, that the, the way they happened was, well, weird. I would hear knocking. It sounded like someone tapping a spoon on a counter coming from the downstairs apartment. It could have been my neighbour, but I'm not sure why she would do that every couple of minutes for hours on end or in the middle of the night. I would also hear knocking on the walls. It sounded like someone tapping their way up the wall, like they were looking for a stud. I would also hear this weird moaning slash howling that I couldn't trace the source of. Again, could have been my neighbor's dog, oh. but it didn't sound like it was coming from her apartment. The apartment across from me had three tenants in a year. I think because it was just, just as or more haunted than mine. That's great. I had, I think, a unique way of coping. I named the ghost Pete after a previous tenant's male. Uh, I would get from time to time and tried to talk, tried talking to him, basically treating him like a roommate. I wasn't a roommate I wasn't friends with. My girlfriend was much more freaked out by the situation than me and basically stopped coming over after a few months, so I wasn't there much anyway. When I was, I felt felt that talking to Pete made the atmosphere of the whole place much more friendly. Hmm. I also left out a sheet of paper with Pete's notes written on it and told him that if he had any problems, just write them down. I still don't know if I believe in ghosts, though I find the supernatural fascinating. But that experience did push me closer to the science doesn't know everything about the universe camp. Hmm. 
I, I, see, I always, I always wanted to do this. If, if I thought there was a ghost, name it, talk to it. Like, no wonder they're just kind of like trying to threaten you and like, you know, do all that sort of stuff. You're just ignoring them all the time. I mean, if there's any consciousness in there and they have been like alone for however much time, you would like they humans might... would forget how to communicate. So maybe ghosts just have the same issue. Yeah, m maybe they just want someone to be friendly and have a friendly. Uh, you know, approach to them. Even if there's no way you can communicate or something, we're on different levels. If there's any kind of crossover, so I was just thinking, like, if the, if there's a you know an entity there and they ha there's any kind of crossover, they just want to be like, oh, a friendly entity. Because if you people have talked of like friendly ghosts, mm. you know, like oh, I thought it was like a family member, and they just you know I had an immense sense of peace when they you know contacted me, that kind of thing. But people do have like threatening ghosts, so maybe it's just like if you're threatening to the ghost or like you know scared of it, it'll be threatening. But if you're friendly, maybe it'll come around. Hmm. <laughs> it's like, come on, ghost. I just was just thinking of um, there was a name for a like mythical cr creature once associated. It was like a, meant to be like a friendly ghost. I can't remember the name. I, was, I wanted to say Selkie, but I don't think that's right. Where hmm. they would effectively like they were like ghosts of like. Taught, said to be ghosts of like cottages and things, so they would like, you know, they would want to look after the person living there, sort of thing. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Mm. Oh. but um, yeah, I, I feel like, you know, if you just go, oh, hello there, to the the ghost, then if you hear like a ding, you're just like, that you, Pete? You know, just like I feel like you won't be as scared because you're interacting with it. You've kind of in, you've brought it in to your circle of influence, so now it's under your control because you're the one who named it. Mm. Whereas if you feel like it's this thing outside of you, then it, you know you, you can't do anything about it. Mm. But um, I like that there were a couple of things in there where I'm like, yeah, it probably could have been that. Like, it could have been the dog, but it didn't come from their apartment. I don't know. It could be a fox. Have you heard foxes? Mm. Like I've been lying in bed and I hear a fox and I go, oh, is someone being mugged? Mm. And then I hear it again and I go, oh, it's a fox. Because they just scream. Like, it's really scary stuff. Yeah, like, definitely. What does the fox say? It just screams in abject horror at the state of capitalism. But, um, yeah, like, you know, the tapping on the walls and stuff like that. Oh, well, well you know... Well, the, the, the tapping on the walls, I actually immediately thought could be right rats or mice. Like, apartment buildings have them, and that, that is I'm, the exact sound. They like. I remember once as a kid, I could not sleep one night. I was an issue sleeping as a kid, a big mm. issue. Um, and uh, I thought I was going mad because I could hear this scratching underneath my bed, and I was like... Am I losing my mind? Mm. Like, what is going on? Thankfully, I didn't think ghosts, but I was like, so I, I think I'm losing my mind. Took everything out from under my bed. There's nothing there. I could just hear this scratching. And then, like, went and bothered my mum. Mum's like, oh, no, you've, you've got a mouse. Yeah. Like, there is a mouse for that. Because, like, say if they're in, they can be in the walls, they can be in the ceiling, under the floor, or just out and about. Like, you know, they get anywhere. And I remember living at a place where there was a mouse that just walked around in, like, the main area. So I sat in my room on my computer and I hear a little tapping and I just go and open the door and poke my head out and it stops. And I'm like, huh, what was that? And I just wait for like a minute and it doesn't continue. And I'm like, that's really weird. I'm sure I heard a tapping. Close my door, get back on my computer. But five minutes later, the tapping starts again. I go, open my door again and it stops. And I'm like, that's really spooked me. But it was just because I'd open my door and the mouse would get scared and stop doing whatever it was doing. Yeah. And then when I close it, it takes like a minute and then it gets back to it. Mm. And then only once I found the mouse, I went, ah, oh, that explains all of the noises that I've been hearing. So like, you know, it could have been that. The whole tapping from like un uh, downstairs, they could have any kind of a anything. They could have like one of those automated cat, you know, toys that just plaps around or something like that. Mm. You know, there's, there's explanations for like taps and noises and things. Well, the fact that it, would, the fact that it was like at weird times and seemingly like not consistent like all the time does make me give me constant like it's regular but it's not like it's randomly and for an extended period of time hmm. if that makes sense and sometimes that's happening in the middle of the night i just you know, maybe, but there could just be a thing yeah i don't, I don't think that's as compelling as the first one mm. i like the first one but i do like pete he's a nice, he's a nice ghost friendly ghost the bit that gets me about it weirdly is like why would you rent an apartment but one room was locked and you don't have the key oh i forgot about that part yeah i guess that's pretty spooky I, Who is Pete in there? There's well, a dead body in that room, isn't there? <laughs> the landlord's just like, just don't well, open it, the room. It just feels like a really ambiguous like facet of the story, like mm. it's mentioned, and then never touched on again. Yeah. I do want to um, just 
rubbish, that one where it was like my girlfriend slept over and we saw a shadowy finger standing in the bathroom and I'm like, sleep paralysis, we've done this. Yeah, <laughs> that, that, that does just happen, that, sadly. That is just sleep paralysis, don't worry about it. Ever, you know, well, not Don't really think it, about it though, because it's an information hazard. Yeah, <laughs> don't research sleep paralysis. Because if you do, you'll get it. Every time we talk about it, I fear it happening. It's okay. I mean, I've had it happen to me once and I managed to break out before anything bad happened. So that was good. Yeah, but I don't know if I'd be able to break out. I think that's the bit that gets me. Yeah, really, the important bit is that you break out because if you don't break out, you are screwed. You got There'll be vivid dreams where, like, sh you know, a coat hanging on the back of your door I, will coalesce well, into, like, a creature. Well, this is the thing. I have had, had yeah. like, a sleep paralysis before, but quite, like, long enough ago that I very vaguely remember it and it's better that way. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? Maybe it'll stay that way. Fingers crossed. I hope so. It's just friendly Pete anyway. <laughs> friendly Pete. Mm. So, should I shimmy us over to the next segment? Yeah. All right. So, it's time for the... the, 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 the it's time for the nice segment. Not that the rest of the stuff we do isn't nice, but you know. Mm, nicer than what we were just yeah. talking about. <laughs> so, if you haven't heard this segment before, it's because it's relatively newish. Um, we basically just... It's the stuff we like se session, section. So... We just talk about something we've enjoyed between recording, basically. Yeah. Who wants to go first? Well, uh, I mean, the first thing that pops into my head, I don't know whether I might have talked about this like last time or something. We've been painting some Warhammer miniatures. Mm. That's That's been really cool. Very, very therapeutic to just do a little bit of painting. Mm. So you got, you know, you get to choose the character that you want and then you can build them. You can give them different weapons and poses and stuff. Mm. You can even get bits off other characters and stick them together. So you make this miniature and then you just kind of paint it, whatever colour scheme you want and everything. Rather therapeutic. You it know, really lots is. Of tiny little models and you just paint in like a tiny little sword. Mm. You know, I've got um, got like a, a skeleton warrior with four arms and he's got a sword in every hand and I was like, General Grievous. <laughs> so like, you can just do whatever you want with it and uh, I find that no, really cool. He's been really nice to get into it and to get back into it and see other people getting into it because... It's a very fun hobby. Like you said, it's very therapeutic. Very expensive, though. Yeah, sadly. Although we, you know, we've that's what hobbies are, I guess. Yeah, I suppose if you if you don't mind sinking the money into it that, and you enjoy it, yeah. that's that's fine. You know, I've spent more on video games, definitely. True, true. I guess uh, I guess my thing for this week, funnily enough, would be um, so uh, finally got to watch part two of an anime that came out quite a while ago okay. um, called Carol on Tuesday. Mm. Uh, I, I may Carol have mentioned and Tuesday. Yes, it's uh, it's on Netflix. Um, the part two was released uh, on Christmas Day, I think, yeah. or around there. And um, basically, it, the, the 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 gist of the story is, you know, that there there is these two girls from very different walks of life who meet each other and start making music together. Okay. Um, you know, it, it a very much like a tone of the show is, you know, that all music is relevant and you know that music is an expression. It's very very nice it's very well animated it's got some mm. brilliant musical numbers and some great voice acting in there okay um, so part two came out and oh my god the sadly i think it we we've not had a season three confirmed and given the nature of the studio that made it are known for making just 24 episode series of something and then yeah. that's it um and that part two made it 24 episodes long and the there's sort of a, an event that they're hinting towards in the opening credits that finally happens at the very end. Hmm. Um, very much actually, you know, mirroring some very real political themes like that we have. Yeah. Um, with like, you know, there's, there is effectively what me and a friend were saying were, were, were essen was essentially a Trump allegory. Like one of the characters is an allegory towards that, but there is then more to it. It becomes a bit of a different hmm. plot, but it's it was just very beautiful very nice, um, had some very nice characters in it, had some very nice design work in it. It looked beautiful, it sounded beautiful, the songs really sort of properly like, stirred emotion, it was very, very heartwarming I would say, and the yeah, ending was... wholesome. Yeah, the ending was absolutely beautiful as well, like, I was literally sat, like, there, because the couch is on the other side of the room. Spoilers, this is my living room, it's not actually a studio, but I figured you'd guessed that. Um, <laughs> But yeah, um, I was sat there, I was like, literally, well, like, basic, effectively welling up, like, because it was just so beautiful, and like, I've had this, the final song from it, like, on loop, pretty much since last night, hmm. all day. Oh, that's really cool. So very heartwarming, very well recommended, I think everyone should watch it. Wholesome anime. Absolutely beautiful, wholesome anime. Hmm. Carol and Tuesday. Carol and Tuesday. 
And with that, I think that's a bit from us this week. Yeah, I guess yeah. we're done. Thank you for tuning in. We always appreciate it. Any topic suggestions or feedback? Give us a little, give a little comment or emails on uh, phenomenalspodcast at gmail.com. We can even give you a shout out if you'd like. Just let us know. And peace out, folks. Stay tuned for more. Bye. You know what? I thought I, I got through mine quite quick. I thought you did really well. Like, I, I, I know you were um, a bit apprehensive. Apprehensive. Uh, I don't know if yeah, that's the like right word. Yeah. Apprehensive. Um, yeah, because it's. I think it came across really well, and I think it's a heavy topic. Through. I I thought it was going to take a lot longer than that, so I'm really glad that that we got to go you, through you those. You were very ghost concise, stories. and you made a lot of sense, which is uh, was very good. Ho- hopefully, it came off. Hell, I, I now understand that way better than I did going in. So yeah, you've taught me something. At the, at the very least. <laughs> but you know, I'm always down for a spook. That that was real mm. nice. I, I am liking the that segment. I got to admit. Mm. <laughs> mm.